All right, folks, looks like we're all almost in. Looks like that number of participants starting to slow down. And if you're watching on YouTube, welcome as well. We're going to get started here in just a few moments. Still see a few people ticking in. Thanks so much for joining us on a Thursday afternoon or potentially Thursday evening or maybe even Friday morning. If the New Zealand group is here, welcome. All right, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Michelle Jewell. You've probably seen me a few times now, and I'm based here at NC State in Raleigh, North Carolina. And as you know by now, hopefully, this is fermentology. It's the mini seminar series on the culture, science, and history of your everyday fermented foods. We've had guests from everywhere, so if you're looking for some of the previous talks, you can simply type in fermentology on YouTube and they will all show up. Uh, and we have a playlist online too. If you look for applied ecology on YouTube, they're all there. And today's guest really doesn't need any introduction whatsoever, but we're joined by fermentology co-founder, Professor Rob Dunn, who's also my hallway neighbor when he's here in Raleigh at the Department of Applied Ecology. And Rob's gonna be chatting with us today about how smell and taste have helped the first humans determine which ferments were safe and good for us and which were probably not. As always, we will have a Q&A at the end, but feel free to put your questions into the chat box or into the Q&A box. I'll watch both of them on Zoom. If you're watching on YouTube, you can put any questions you have in the YouTube chat box too. List them as you have them, and then I will grab a few questions at the end and ask them to Rob on your behalf. But as always, unfortunately, I probably won't get to everybody's questions, so I do apologize for that. Rob's very easy to find online, so I'm sure he'll be happy to take your questions <laughs> if you need. <laughs> and without any further ado, Rob? Thank you so away. much, Michelle. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so I wanted to actually start off um, by giving a sort of status quo uh, of where we are Let's see, I can't see all my things here, um, of where we are with fermentology. And so to date, we've had 25 talks, 40,000 views, roughly 100 new views a day. And we've covered with the seminar series, bread to watermelons from the Paleolithic to tomorrow. And, and we've done this in large part because of Michelle. And I think what not everybody knows about Michelle is that Michelle's uh, history and field of study coming into this is not fermentation, but instead equal parts science communication and shark biology. And, and so Michelle has stepped into this totally new arena and, and run this amazing series of talks. And so I'd just like to begin with a, a thanks to Michelle for going through the shark's mouth and in, into its fermentative uh, parts of its, its world. We're really grateful and uh, done just a wonderful job. We have exciting news and thinking about the future of fermentology, which is that we're in um, conversations about our new partnership with the North Carolina State University Libraries and the UNC Press for a project that will wed fermentology talks to essays, photos, and interviews and th this is going to be slowly unfolding. Some of you already have essays that are uh, involved in this, but if you want to check it out as it's sort of progressing, we're building this uh, at this site, fermentology.pubpub.org. And it's a, it's a fun mess right now, but if you want to kind of poke around the mess and get a sense of where we might be going, you can. Uh, and the people who are working on the mess are going to be horrified that I shared it, but please do check it out. Now I wanna to transition to talking about uh, flavor and taste in the context of fermentation. And where I will go with this is to a consideration of the, the book that was just published last week, Delicious with Monica Sanchez, which really considers the role of flavor in our human story in general. But before I get there, I wanna back out a little bit because if we think about the big story of humans, there are some fields in which flavor has always been, been central or has been episodically central. And so if we think, for example, about writers and artists, writers and artists often put flavor and deliciousness in the center of their works. And so this is true with the transition to still lifes. Still lifes are this amazing moment, the repeating moment in art 
when you go from having kings at the center of things to plums at the center of things. But it also happens in poetry. And, and so I thought I would just begin by sharing a couple of poems that are germane to, to the main points I'll be making today, both by William Carlos Williams. The first is, this is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. And then this one, to a poor old woman munching a plum on the street, a paper bag of them in her hand. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. You can see it by the way she gives herself to the one half sucked out in her hand, comforted, a solace of ripe plums seeming to fill the air. They taste good to her. And why I think it's germane to begin there is that in our new book, what we attempt to do is to revisit the human story with the same attention to flavor and deliciousness that Williams offers the plum. Leave it to time to see if we, we succeed, but this is what we try to do. And in short, we consider why it tastes good to her, but also why it matters that it does. And our argument throughout the book is that many of the key transitions in human evolution, flavor played a role. When confronted with a more delicious food and a less delicious food, our ancestors tended to choose the more delicious food. They chose what tasted good to them. From such choices, much follows. In the context of the book, we consider this argument in the context of a series of, of mysteries. Stick tools, big brains, fire, culinary traditions, extinctions, avocados, fermentation, spice use, art, food sharing, and more. Uh, these more or less, these mysteries map onto the chapters in the book. But today I'll only be able to talk about two of these, culinary traditions and fermentations. And so basically I'll be talking about two chapters from the book. And I wanna begin with culinary traditions because I think it's these traditions that really set the stage for a lot of what we've been hearing about in fermentology throughout the year. And well, culinary traditions are quite ancient. We infer that they're ancient because some of our closest relatives also have them. And so, for example, chimpanzees have culinary tra traditions, and these are often manifest in the context of their tool use. And so this is just a short video from my colleagues at the Max Planck in Leipzig, and it shows a variety of kinds of tool use by chimps, most of them having to do with food. There's one sort of mysterious kind of tool use here that I won't talk about more, but it's pretty fun. It's, it's a kind of tool use for the chimps for reasons that are very unclear pile stones up inside hollow trees. And different populations of chimpanzees do this, and we have no idea why. I won't talk about it more, but you'll see it. So let me just play this for a second. This is the mysterious stone piling. Now, this tool use is amazing for, for many reasons. Um, it's, it's a window into how our ancestors might have used tools, stone, stone tools and stick tools, even before they made things like spears or scrapers. Uh, but it also is a window into uh, what might have been going on with our ancestors with regard to culinary cultures. And to put this in context, I just want to show this, this slide here, which is a evolutionary tree of humans and our closest living relatives. And what we know about these species is that orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans all use tools for various food related things. And chimpanzees and humans use them often. And so it's typically inferred that our common ancestors also use them often. What's not often, not as often described about this reality is that the ways in which different populations of chimpanzees and almost certainly our ancestors use tools can vary for reasons having to do with the environment, 
but can also vary in ways that seem to have nothing to do with the environment and are just due to tradition. And so, for example, Jane, Jane Goodall studied chimpanzees at the Gombe National Park site that you see here, uh, sort of the middle of the screen. And Toshisada Nishida studied chimpanzees roughly the same time period at Mahali Mountain National Park, a little bit farther south. These two sites are very, very similar with regard to their plants and also with regard to their animals, including insects such as ants. But the chimpanzees at the two sites eat different things. And one of the most conspicuous cases of this relates to ants. And so uh, at the site that Jane Goodall did most of her work at, the chimpanzees use stick tools to eat chromatogaster ants and army ants. In contrast, at Mahale, chimpanzees in a near identical environment eat carpenter ants using stick tools. And this has been true for decades. And this is attributed to, to culinary traditions. They've just learned to eat these different things. That's what their group does. And, and so the more we look at chimpanzees across the range of modern and extinct chimpanzees, the more it seems to be the case that there are often these culinary traditions that have nothing to do with the environment, or at least they're not exclusively de de determined by the environment. And so the question becomes, how does this happen? Uh, and it's interesting to ask this question of how this happens because what culinary traditions offer are lasting cultural adaptations to new environments, but, but they also lead different populations to eat different foods in similar environments. And so if we think about our own ancestors moving out around the world, and really moving to very, very different climates, whatever is at play in these culinary traditions would have been super important in that movement and with regard to the new foods that they adopted in these different places. And so what's going on? How does it happen? To explain how it happens, I need to give a quick little glossary of the different aspects of flavor and what's going on with the mouth. And I'll just say that the way I'll define these terms is the way that food scientists define them. It's not necessarily the way we use them in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so taste in this context is a series of sensations associated with taste receptors on the tongue, including sour, sweet, bitter, umami, maybe kukumi. Uh, and these tastes are really kind of a sensory guide toward things we need and away from things we don't need. Mouthfeel is a sense of touch in the mouth. And we tend to think this sounds silly, like mouth, mouth feels the, the most ridiculous sounding aspect of flavor. And yet it's potentially very important. A, a big part of the joy that comes from eating a fatty avocado is about the mouth feel. Retronasal aromas are the aromas of foods once they're in our mouths and when their lightweight chemicals go up into the backs of our noses from our mouths. And so it's that smell that happens from the mouth. Chemisthesis is the sense that's associated with spicy foods, but also cooling foods like menthol. And so chili peppers and menthol are chemisthesis. I won't talk more about it today, but it's, it's an entirely different sense. And then flavor is this composite. And so my argument will be that flavor is really important to these culinary traditions and that aroma and retronasal aromas in particular are disproportionately important. Retronasal aromas are not the only kind of aromas. In fact, they're not the one we most often think about. The kind of aroma we most often think about are orthonasal aromas associated with orthonasal olfaction. And this is what happens when a dog sniffs the world. A dog blows air out of its nose, it disrupts smell molecules on the ground, and then it sniffs in and inhales. Those molecules go back up into its nose and are detected by olfactory receptors. That's orthonasal olfaction. But this retronasal olfaction is different. Uh, it happens once foods are in our mouths and it's happening with this guy here with this hamburger. He's probably getting a little bit of orthonasal olfaction, getting some bun smell that's coming from up through his nose. But the majority of what he's experiencing there is the retronasal olfaction. And Daniel Lieberman and Gordon Shepard have both argued, and we, we consider this argument in the book, that humans are really specialists in retronasal olfaction, compared, especially compared to dogs that are sort of specialists in orthonasal olfaction. Dogs are really good at sniffing the world in front of them. We're really good at sniffing a piece of cheese that's on our tongue. And this becomes really important because the system of olfaction is connected to our brains in really, really amazing and intricate ways. 
that suggests that in some ways, it's maybe the most important sense to us in terms of how we make, make sense of the world. And I liken it to a card catalog, which I know makes me seem old, but it's, I think it's the right um, analogy or metaphor. It used to be the case you would go to a library, there was a card catalog for subjects, there was one for titles, and there was one for authors. And maybe in some libraries, there were additional uh, groupings. And you would go and you would look for the subject you wanted or the title you wanted or the author you wanted. And you could see related things or alphabet alphabetically related things on subsequent cards. And something similar happens in our brain, although it's a little bit more elaborate. Because what happens in our brain is that each time we smell something, that experience receives two cards. One card is associated with something like the title of the experience, a story recorded as a memory. I was eating cheese with my friend and you know whatever happened next. The second card records the subject of the cheese, or the subject that is cheese in this case. And so there are these two cards that help to organize the experience of olfaction. And the more different experiences accumulate in a particular subject, the more finely the subject cards are divided. Also, the less random the connections among subjects become. Cheeses become divided into hard and soft cheeses. Then soft cheeses become divided into blue cheeses and, for example, washed rind cheeses and so on. And so here, an expert is then somebody you can distinguish and so whose card catalog has many divisions. And so you can think about this in your own life. In some, in some fields or in some foods, no doubt you have a broad category. A student in my class, when we brought in a bunch of cheeses to smell, uh, all the cheeses smelled to her like, uh, like cheesy potato chips, right? Very broad category. But no doubt you also have things in which you have narrower categories. And, and each of us builds these categories and subcategories. But the super interesting thing, and I think that's really important for us in terms of making sense of the world as we explore, is that there's this third element. Each experience is assigned a level of pleasurableness, such that smells that are always associated with pleasurable experiences become good smells, and smells associated with bad experiences become bad smells. In essence, it's a review of the book, or it's sort of a Yelp system for the nose. And as far as neuroscientists understand, there are no intrinsic goods or bads in olfaction. With taste, there are. With taste, your tongue is always leading you towards sweet and leading you away from bitter. With olfaction, the thinking is that, that, we, that none of this is uh, innate, um, or none of, it's, none of it's at least genetic. And so you could learn to love a skunk, and you could learn to hate lavender. And, and this is not how ecologists see the world, but, but it's at least the neuroscience understanding of what's going on so far. But where this becomes really interesting is that this is, is in essence a library, a ranked library of the world that we can imagine our ancestors using as they went out around the world to categorize things, to make sense of them and to sort good from bad, delicious from not delicious in ways that were incredibly beneficial and that would have worked like for example, in the chimpanzee context, even before our ancestors could speak much less right. And all of this begins really early in, in life and remarkably early. And there's an amazing set of studies done by Benoit Schall and, and other scientists looking at when we start to learn to love some smells and learn to dislike others. And one series of studies has focused on pregnant mothers. And so, for example, uh, Schall did a study where he compared mothers who were eating anise and not eating anise. And uh, he made sure that the mothers who were assigned to not eating anise didn't eat anise during, while they were pregnant, and the mothers who were supposed to eat anise ate lots of it. And then he compared the babies after three hours of those mothers with regard to how they felt about anise. Now, you can't ask the three-hour-old three baby, but what he could do was to look at their faces. And so he would put a little cotton swab in front of their face that either had anise on it or didn't have anise on it. And then he would look at whether they made a scrunchy face associated with displeasure or a lick lipping face associated with pleasure. And lots of these studies have now been done, but this anise one I think is particularly telling. And so what he found was for the babies that whose mothers ate anise, when they were presented with that anise Q-tip, that they were much more likely to lick their lips and to make faces as though they were going to wanted to nurse and to do this for longer time periods. In contrast, the babies that uh, 
whose mothers did not eat anise, they reacted the same with regard to lick lipping as they would have as if there was nothing on the Q-tip except Q-tip. In contrast, when looking at uh, scrunchy facedness, the babies whose mothers were anise eaters almost never showed a scrunchy face in response to anise smells. And the babies whose mothers were not anise eaters were far more likely to show a scrunchy face and to do so for longer time periods. And so this has now been shown to be the case for garlic, for fermented fish, for some vegetables, for blue cheese. And in every case, it's positive. If your mother eats something while she's pregnant with you, you were born liking that thing. Contingent, it's the right kind of chemical. And so it's as though our mother's bodies are teaching us what I eat is good to eat. Now, what's amazing about that is if we think about our ancestors moving out across the world, the first generation, they arrived in a new habitat, in the tundra, in the desert, in the rainforest. They would have had to sort through things anew. But the second generation was already learning at birth which things to like and which things not to like. And, and so this is a sort of built-in way to rapidly establish culinary traditions that we have to imagine was then fast forwarded once our ancestors could talk and who could say, this tastes so good. This makes me happy. This is what I love to eat when I'm around you. And so this culinary tradition component is very, very important. And, and I think really at the root of the creation of new foods, once our ancestors start not only to look for new foods, but actually to make foods. And I think this poem by Jane Hirschfield is, is really evocative here. She writes, my species, even a small purple artichoke boiled in its own bittered and darkening waters grows tender, grows tender and sweet. Patience, I think my species keep testing the spiny leaves. And so you test the spiny leaves in one generation, but the next generation is already born knowing it, what's the right way to, to eat them or how to feel when they're prepared in the right way. And I think this then becomes very important as we think about one of the forms of creation most important to our group, fermentation. Oops. Fermentation, as, as I'll consider it today, has two mysteries. The first is when does the control of fermentation begin? And here I'm thinking about fermented foods in the broadest context. So to include cheese, fermented fish, beer, wine, cider, kimchi, sauerkraut, leavened bread, garum, soy sauce, fish paste, kombucha, cured ham, and literally thousands and thousands of other foods united by the reality that they've been transformed, which is to say created through the control of microbes. And, and so when does this start is, is the beginning mystery here. And then the second mystery is how do we control this? And does this culinary culture phenomenon play a role? First, with regard to when this starts, we've actually seen a lot already in this talk series about the beginnings of fermentation. In the classic story of fermentation and the classic story of our diets, our history looks something like this. Maybe 8 million years ago, we begin to use stick tools. We then have a long period of reliance on fruit, leaves, maybe roots and insects. Stone tools turn up about 2.3 million years ago. About 1.9 million years ago, our brains get way bigger, our teeth start getting smaller. Something important in the culinary world happens there. A million years ago, or maybe earlier, if Richard Wrangham is light, right, fire becomes part of our story. And then we get agriculture, and then we get beer, and, and you know, th then things stop. It's been known for a long time that maybe this was more complex. Um, for, for one, when we look at the importance of fermentation in those time periods in which we know a lot, it seems really, really central. It doesn't seem like an add-on. And so we saw this in Tate Paulette's amazing talk on, uh, on early beers, but we also know it from other contexts. But the other thing we're starting to see is that when people look more, they see more evidence of early fermentations. And so, for example, it's now been argued by Neil Rush, who we, we saw a talk from not very long ago, that mead was actually much, much earlier than agriculture. And so we began to farm the microbes associated with mead began, before we began to farm grains. And so you can see Neil's great talk on this topic in this series. <clears throat> 
But then there's this bit about beer, which for whatever reason has really preoccupied people with regard to thinking about the history of fermentation. And it too now seems to be earlier. Lee Liu at Stanford uh, recently published a study suggesting that it, in what is now Israel, there's evidence of uh, barley malting and fermentation going back 13,000 years before agriculture arrives in the same area. And so all these dates are really pushing back and really allowing us to think about uh, fermentation as, as being earlier than agriculture and setting the stage. And then Amaya and Lara in this talk series talked about the prehistory of bread and have, fa have found bread that clearly predates agriculture. The open question being whether that bread was fermented or not, we don't know. And then Katie Amato in this talk series talked about the possibility that maybe fermentation is actually much, much older that maybe it begins with Homo erectus. Maybe it's 1.9 million years old. Maybe it's what allowed the big brains in the first place and, and catapulted us to our current moment. Uh, and so you can see that wonderful talk. What, one thing about this story that I think is especially fascinating and, and Katie highlights it and we also highlight it in the book is the evidence if you look across primates that you actually see much more use of fermentation and control of fermentation than anybody thought before. And so Katie's really highlighted uh, this example of work by Liz Mallet of capuchin monkeys that actually seem to knock down fruits intentionally and then come back to them weeks later when they're fermented. And so it really begs the question, if the capuchin monkeys can do this, uh, why couldn't our own ancestors have done it long before the, they began to control other aspects of their environment? And so we don't know, but I think it's interesting to think about this and we'll have more talks on this, this theme. But the other question that emerges here, the other part of this mystery is once our ancestors began to, to ferment, how did they know which ferments were safe? And to me, this really comes to a head in the context of, of work by Dan Fisher at the University of Michigan. And Dan has found evidence that mastodons in the in Michigan and, and thereabouts um, may have been moved, butchered with stone tools, moved into ponds and lakes 12,000 years ago by Clovis people, and then fermented for months uh, so that the mastodon meat was available throughout the winter. And the way Dan approached this study, and this was first to document archeological sites where it looked as though this had happened, but then also to borrow a horse from one of his friends and to use that horse to recreate this process, not with a mastodon, with a, but with a horse. And the horse I should say was dead and I probably shouldn't have chosen such a beautiful horse. But in any case, what Dan did was to make stone tools, use those stone tools to butcher the horse. And then he put a, the horse in a pond and he went back to check on it over months. And what's amazing about this experiment, other than that Dan did it, I mean, it's fascinating, uh, is that, Five months later, when he when it decided the experiment was done because the meat had sort of started to push apart and moved through the pond and he couldn't get to all of it, the meat had a flavor like Stilton cheese and steak all in one, and it was sour. And so this is really fascinating because it suggests that you could make a delicious ferment just by rolling a mastodon, a butchered mastodon, into a lake. But it really goes back to that question of how would you know if this was safe? How would you make it safe? And I, I think here that the most obvious answer is that our ancestors relied on their smell library to learn the good smells associated with a good ferment and to learn the bad smells associated with a bad ferment and then to build on those so that they knew they were doing the right thing. And I should say, we learn pretty quickly good smells. We learn really quickly bad smells. If, if a smell associated with a food, if that food makes you throw up when you eat it, you can learn in one instance of eating that food not to like it. It's called the Garcia effect. Some poor guy named Garcia discovered it uh, and, and now it bears his name. But so you can imagine this played a very important role in sorting out good ferments from bad ferments. The other part that I think is really interesting here is that our work and the work of other labs has begun to show the intimate relationship between ferments and people's bodies. That microbes from fermentation can colonize people's bodies and that 
microbes from people's bodies colonize their fermentations. And so we might also imagine that as people are learning to love certain fermentation smells, those are also the daily smells of their own bodies. And so there's this sort of intimate knowing of the food and the people that I think is probably more important than we think. And so imagine that one learns the right smell, the bodily smell of a good ferment, and then acts to engender that smell, which in turn becomes encoded in rituals and norms, much as doctors could once sniff out a sick patient, cooks could sniff out a bad ferment. I think this is potentially very important. The other part that seems important and we talk about in the book is sour taste. Now, when we went to write about this when writing the book, it became clear that there wasn't a single paper that, that it attempted to comprehensively explain the evolution of sour taste and what it does. Paul Breslin, who you see pictured here in the bottom right, my right, um, had written a, a paper that considered what sour taste does in two paragraphs, but that was it. And so while writing the book, we pulled together a, a team of people led, led by uh, Hannah, who you, let's see where, uh, Hannah Frank, who you see in the bottom, to try to consider what do we know about sour taste and what can we learn from it? And does it bear in any way on our understanding of fermentation? And this was has been a super exciting collaboration because each of these people has a different special skill. And so Kurt Schwenk in the top right is an expert in taste in reptiles. Uh, Emily Lehman recently discovered this our taste receptor. Paul Breslin's looked at the evolution of, of taste in general. Katie Amato, you've met. And so it was a super team. And what we hoped we might initially do was to imagine that we could take the new protein and its gene that Emily had discovered, this new sour taste receptor, and then we could look at how it evolved through time as a measure of how our sour taste has changed, and then see if this matches up in any way with consumption of foods that might be fermented. But the trick with this, and why we couldn't do it, is that that same uh, protein and its gene also does lots of other things in the body, and so it can't be used to trace the evolution of sour taste, not on its own anyway. And so what we did instead, was to search the literature for any studies where people had looked at particular vertebrates and whether they could detect acidity in their food and how they responded to it. And so these are all the species we could find that have been studied. And what we thought we would do is to find, well, which ones can detect acidity, which can't. In fact, we found that all these species could detect acidity in their foods. And so as far as we know, all vertebrates can detect sour. Uh, it could be that the ones that can't have just not been studied, but we don't know. But then the second part of this was to consider which of these species like acidic foods. And so, so to figure out which might be oriented toward things that are rotting. And so if we look at these top groups, amphibians, reptiles, birds, marsupials, bats, none of the species considered liked acidic foods, even slightly acidic foods. If we looked at the undulates, there was a little bit of variation. And so pigs and goats appear to at least sometimes like acidic foods. That was intriguing. If we look down here at the rodents and the rabbits, uh, none of them appeared to like acidic foods. And then if we looked at our, our own group, the primates, what we saw was a lot of variation. And so some primates clearly like acidic foods, including humans, chimpanzees, um, night monkeys, and so the primate story seems very different from the story of the rest of these species. Why might this be? What Paul Breslin has argued and, and we reiterate is the possibility that part of this story relates to vitamin C. So primate ancestors lost the ability to produce vitamin C. And so you might imagine that that predisposes them to needing more vitamin C from their diets. And so perhaps in some context, it becomes important to like sour, to like acidity, because it can sometimes be an indication of ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C. And so that might be part of the story. We also think there are other things going on, but I think that the more germane part to our story today is what the consequences of primate liking uh, of sour things are. And so what we think is possible here is that liking sour taste allowed our ancestors and other primates to use the tongue like a kind of pH 
test paper, but then also to, to use it to find which things were potentially good and safe. And this becomes uh, clearer in the context of recent work by Erin McKinney. Erin's led this beautiful paper in which she's considered fermentation of a series of different kinds of sourdough breads. And she, she's seen all kinds of things here, but one of the things that she's seen is if you look over the numbers of days of making a sourdough starter, the lactic acid bacteria become more common. No, no huge surprise, but it's very, very consistent. The other thing that happens is, is that as the lactic acid bacteria become more common, the sourdough becomes more acidic. And it also becomes safe because when it gets to that pH of four, most of the foodborne pathogens that might be present are gone. And so if we use this sourdough as an example, if, we, if our ancestors use their tongues and, and complement with their noses to assess fermentation, they have a way to figure out, is this a good fermentation and is this a safe fermentation built into their sensory systems? And so it's noteworthy that that fermented horse had a flavor like Stilton cheese and steak all in one, and it was sour. And so imagine that one learns the right smell, the bodily smell of a good ferment, and the acts that engender that smell, which in turn become encoded in rituals and norms. Much as doctors could once sniff out a sick patient, cooks could sniff out a bad ferment. And just to make sure, the tongue also checks acidity. What we wanna do now is, is to engage you in a, an endeavor in which we're gonna see what, what people who practice fermentation today, what do you use as a judge of, of the safety of your ferment? How do you judge whether your ferment is good? How do you judge if it's safe? What are the characteristics of a good or bad ferment? What, what does traditional kitchen knowledge teach us about what our ancestors might've been able to do? And so we'll be starting this project soon, but if you have ideas about how to do this or, or things you would like to see asked, feel free to email us. And so I'm gonna close there. I don't imagine that Monica and I in our book and the story I've told you today have resolved any of the mysteries of our evolution fully or the mystery of fermentation fully, but I do hope that I've given you a little sense of why considering flavors shines a new light on some of these mysteries. All the stories I've told today are considered in more detail in the book, along with all these other things I'd like to talk more about like avocados and spices, but I won't talk about today. And I will close there, uh, but thank you very much. And thank you for participating in this seminar series. It's been such a joy for us to, to organize it and to, and to hear back from people about um, their joyful experiences of the series. And so, so thank you for being a part of it. It really makes a big difference to us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. We have, I'll give you guys a little bit of time to throw your Q&A or your Qs rather, and we'll throw A's back at you um, into the chat boxes there. Lucy's got one that looks like it's the next chapter in your book after some of the topics that you talked about here. But Lucy was asking about um, how do we determine which spices and flavors go well together? Uh, is it to do with survival? Is there an element of that in it? Or is it just not getting bored with eating the same stuff? over and over again? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Lucy. I don't, I don't see you here, but um, the, so we don't know a ton and there are differing opinions depending on field. And, and so psychologists tend to think of it as, as largely um, you know, a co construct of our social settings and culture. And you know, some of our additions of spices are maybe about um, a kind of benign masochism. And so Paul Ros Rosen argues this, that when you eat really spicy food, it's kind of like going to a scary movie. It feels a little bit dangerous, but you know you're not going to die. Uh, and, so, and so having a little bit of a scary movie each time you eat, maybe there's something to that. At, at the same time, we also know, and we've done some experiments on this, that some spices have a, a really strong effect on the biology of the food. And so garlic and onion, for example, seem to have a really strong effect on some microbes, including pathogens. And so you can imagine that that's also part of the story. So there's food and medicine didn't used to be so separate. And so you can imagine that spices are a way of adding a kind of medicine to our food, especially if you don't have refrigeration. And so you leave a pot of something overnight, 
Uh, and if it can, you can still eat it in the morning, that's pretty beneficial. But then the other part is, is what you mentioned that as foods get blander, especially post agriculture, that there's this value in adding things back in. And so there's some evidence that Neanderthals use spice, and we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Um, but the first well-documented spice use is really at the boundary of, of agriculture uh, in, in Europe. And, and so it looks like it's possible that maybe it's playing this functional role, but it's also associated with sort of a blandness of food. And so maybe you're adding some spices in to sort of enrich the flavors. Um, and then there's a separate question about Lucy. Yeah, I'm answering like eight questions, Lucy, sorry. <laughs> um, about how that all fits together. Like what's a good mix of spices and then other components in a food? Um, and there's some people using big data to study this in pretty beautiful ways of like which things never come together, which things often come together. But one thing we do know from looking at the history and prehistory is lots of the combinations that we th think of as being associated with particular food traditions are really, really old. Um, and so the oldest uh, in the Indus River Valley, there's an amazing site. Um, I'm going to get my dates wrong, but let's say it's about 3000. Well, there's an Indus, they're very old Indus River Valley site um, wh where they found evidence of a set of spices that were being used together that very much reflect modern spices in the same region. Mm. And, and so, I mean, that's also a really interesting part. Um, and then I think the last fascinating part there is, uh, I think often in those mixtures, there's a lot of traditional knowledge that's implicit in the mixture that nobody ever talks about. And so if you make a food the traditional way it's been made, you get whatever benefit of that traditional knowledge is there without necessarily knowing what it is. And then when you start to mix them in new ways, you create sort of new settings to be ignorant, which can be fun in a culinary way, but it also means you're intentionally um, doing something different from what people learn to do. And I think in fermentation, that gets more dangerous than it does in other arenas. Right, right. Uh, yeah, thanks, Lucy. <laughs> yeah, and along, uh, well, hold on. We've got lots of questions coming in now. Um, I'm going to take us completely into a different direction with Elise here. Wondering about um, acidity. And you were talking about how this is linked to our, we may be like acid, acidic things because of our inability to create our own vitamin C. Has this been tested with other animals yet that can't create their own vitamin C, like guinea pigs, things like that? Yeah, so it's a great question. So um, I think what, what Breslin would argue, and so he's the first one to argue this, and, and so I'll uh, sort of voice his argument here, is that it becomes important when you, um, you lack the ability to make vitamin C and you move into an environment where it becomes more rare. And so imagine that you're a chimpanzee population in a forest environment eating lots of fruits and there's plenty of vitamin C and you shift to a savanna environment where vitamin C might be more rare. It's in those contexts when you might expect there to be more selection to favor the ability to enjoy sour. Mm -hmm. um, the simple answer to the bats and the guinea pigs is that two, two bats have been tested as far as we could find. And two guinea pigs, although the species uh, were not, if I recall right, were not identified. Uh, and so in, in neither of those cases did there appear to be uh, any evidence that they liked acidic foods. But there are, you know, guinea pigs are reasonably diverse and bats are extraordinarily diverse. And so if, if Breslin is right, my expectation would be that there are bats that have shifted their diet enough that vitamin C becomes rare, and then you might expect them to do something different. So bat people, uh, take a look. And here we have, okay, we've got a few more here. Let me try and grab one more. Oh, okay. oh Biosphere is this here, good. Great, the New Zealand people are here too. Um, um, oh, Lisa's got a great question related to all this too. Just threw it in the chat. Um, why would we lose the ability to produce vitamin C if we still need it so badly? Um, so the, the number of papers on this is quite small. They're great papers, but they're few. 
And, and so the argument is that there are certain environments in which it's very readily available in diets. And so in there, those contexts, if the gene associated with producing it breaks, the consequences of that are not very great. Um, but then if you move out of that environment, uh, the consequences become greater. Uh, and so you can imagine in the ancestral primate in which this uh, occurred, that in that moment, there was no lack. Right. But then in the subsequent tens of millions of years, primates moved into many habitats in which there was lack. Um, and and th this is this is Breslin's argument, which I, I find quite plausible. Um, but I mean, re really, it's six papers tops. So wow. if somebody's interested, there's lots of fun work to be done. Nice. There you go, folks. There it is. Um, and then lastly, I'll just finish with Jermaine's question here. Um, when would people might have discovered that the use of spice, spices and salt uh, could initiate fermentation, like sauerkraut, for example? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so I think one question there, and this is for the um, ancient protein people and the ancient lipid people, is, is what evidence would you look for that people had started to spice those ferments? And so with a, if you're adding a berry or something, that's pretty easy to look for. If you know a specific protein or lipid associated with that berry, I don't know what you would look for to see that you're starting to see salting. Mm. People have ideas, um, feel free to email that. But, but in my habitat, in my ambit, there are lots of people that are starting to use ancient techniques to look at fermentation. And so I think we're gonna see lots of movement in what we know about these things in the next years. I mean, it will go fast, um, yeah. Nice, well, we'll pick up fermentology again during those times and see what their answers are. Rob, thank you so much. Uh, before I let everybody go, I just want to plug our next series of talks on April 15th. Uh, we have Rebecca Rag Sykes is joining us. You may, that name might be coming out to you. That's because she's just authored the book Kindred and she'll be joining um, to talk about some Neanderthal recipes, how they would have cooked uh, themselves, maybe different foods, and also some drinks that she's gonna talk about potentially. So we'll have a lot of fun with that one. And also I'll be throwing a uh, coupon code for her book as well into the next email that I send out. So keep a look in your inbox for that. And that is on April 15th. And that's it folks, we'll see you then. Be well, thank you so much Rob for your time. Thank you everybody.